doing this. Um, I, I want to uh, let you guys know that the private barrel auction is presented by Winebow, Fine Wine and Spirits. And the virtual series is presented by Northwest Farm Credit Services and the Washington State Farm Commission. This has been an amazing series. It's just incredible that the private barrel auction uh, is, is in its sixth year and it's raised over $800,000 for Washington State University Viticulture and Enology Research. Just an amazing cause. It's, they're doing some world-class research and um, really helping educate the next generation of winemakers. Speaking of winemakers, we have three esteemed panels today making a lot of different kinds of wine throughout the state. Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of introduction and uh, then get right into the wines, which is the exciting part to uh, taste with the winemakers, get their thoughts on these very special wines that are only available for the private barrel auction. All right, so um, let's uh, start with Casey McClellan from Seven Hills. Hello everybody and welcome. Um, appreciate you all be, being here to support the private barrel auction and our industry research. It's a great cause and it helps us make better wine. So I'm a winemaker and founder of Seven Hills Winery, um, one of the founding uh, brands of the Walla Walla Valley. Um, I'm a formerly trained winemaker. Uh, and I've also been making wine since 1988 here in the Walla Walla Valley. And I'm really happy to be sharing the, one of those wines uh, with you today. Our focus is uh, on Bordeaux Reds and Sauvignon Blanc and then a Rosé of Cap Franc. Uh, and today we're going to be looking at uh, a very high-end Merlot that's been specially made for the auction. And uh, the winery is located in beautiful downtown Walla Walla, so come visit us sometime. Yeah, it's a great location uh, right by the former White House Crawford. And uh, like you said, ro Rosé, you make a beautiful Rosé each year. I'm already looking forward to trying that uh, later this spring. We also have a guy that makes fantastic Rosé, James Mantone from Syncline. He's got a really exciting uh, wine to present later. Uh, James, if you want to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your winery. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm James Mantone. I have Syncline Winery. Uh, my wife and I founded it in 99 here in the Columbia Gorge. And that's the Columbia Gorge that borders the Oregon border. So we're the southern end of the state, uh, right kind of in the Cascade Mountains and the eastern foothills. And we specialize, for years we've specialized on Rhone varieties. Um, and more and more, we're kind of pulling back more into the gorge here where we're growing a lot of Savoie um, and kind of continental style grapes in our climate here. We, so we do, but that being said, we harvest more and more Vedra than any other grape uh, for our winery. We make a rosé of more Vedra and a bunch of other Rhone varieties, but uh, also kind of adding to our portfolio here in the gorge with Gamay and Mondeuse and Savignon and some other crazy things. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, this is gonna be a lot of fun. And we, uh, last but not least, we have Lynn Scott from Sparkman Cellars. Lynn, you've been uh, at Sparkman quite some time, make some beautiful wines for them. Yep, it's been been a few years now. This is just passed through my 11th harvest with, um, with the Sparkmans. I started in the early 2000s in tasting rooms and decided, you know, if I'm really gonna, and working in people's cellars, and if I'm gonna make this uh, like a, career of this I need I need to go to school so I did a master's program in uh, France and Germany and then when I came back out of that program and came back home to Washington I'm from Seattle so then I started um, working working with the Sparkmans and I taught for several years at South Seattle College program uh, and I've spent the last five or six years on the Washington State Wine Research Advisory Committee which is the organ one of the kind of entities that helps direct the funds that come from the auction that go to Washington State University. And I'm currently uh, chair on that advisory committee. Yeah, you, uh, you stay busy and you also make a really beautiful wine, a range of wines for Sparkman. Everything from uh, Anki, Dark, Syrah to Great Rosé, make a killer Riesling as well. Can you um, share a little bit about your wine program at Sparkman? Yeah, absolutely. So we've, we fluctuate between <laughs> 25 to some years almost as many as 30 different products we pull uh, from I mean a lot of the same terrific vineyards that, that the other panelists do as well but um, it's a it's a really broad broad ranging broad ranging program so we're doing Trigan Nacional. we do work with Suzao we we did a Pinot Noir out of the Willamette Valley we've done um, and then 
you know, 5,000 cases of cab or something like that. So it's kind of the, not the, we love the variety, but we love the variety of wines, but, you know, Cabernet is the one that we've kind of landed on as being the one that's, I mean, really kind of the linchpin in the, in the program. Yeah. I mean, um, you're, you've been an educator, a wine educator yourself for several years. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it means to be contributing to this awesome program, the Washington State University uh, Viticulture and Enology program? Oh, it's, I mean, first of all, it's when, um, when I was in school, I did my, my thesis work at Geisenheim in Germany, but Thomas Hennick Kling at Washington State University who just landed there was in Geisenheim to visit with uh, one of my professors and I ran into him in the hallway and we started talking and I ended up doing my project for my research, you know, back here in Washington State. So I wasn't enrolled at Washington State University, but I worked with Thomas and a bunch of the other people there. And it's, and I've, you know, for 10 years, we've been, you know, staying in touch and keeping going. And it's been a really, it's, it's a, you know, special thing to see the Wine Science Center grow, to see the amount of money going towards the, towards research growing every, you know, every single year. And it's, um, it's, you know, we all know it's a great community, but the research community is really important too. And it makes it, you know, Washington's not like, not like everywhere else. So we've, you know, get to work on our own research and kind of aim and directions that are a little bit more specific to, you know, opportunities and problems that we have in Washington. Yeah, well, you have a really cool wine that you're going to present um, for the public uh, private barrel auction. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided to choose this wine and maybe a little bit behind the winemaking, vineyard sources, et cetera? Love to hear yeah, more you about bet. that. Yeah, yeah. So um, the previous two years that we participated in this, we had done a done a wine called Black Dragon, which was half Petit Verdot and half Malbec. I don't make any of the names, and this is all this is all Chris Sparkman's department. Um, and I think Black Dragon was one that maybe Kelly didn't love the name on, but Chris loved it, so he snuck it in. Um, this vintage, we, we've moved away from that wine and uh, we've focused on Old Vine Cabernet. 2018 is maybe one of my, maybe my favorite vintage of wines to, to have worked with. And in a kind of dark 2020, it was nice to, <laughs> to spend a lot of time with those wines in the cellar. So this is Cabernet from three Old Vine sites that we work with. Everybody knows, you know, Dick Boucher at Boucher Vineyard, great old vine cab there planted in the early 80s. Uh, some Cabernet from Gamache Vineyard. So that's up kind of in what will now become, I think that'll be part of what's White Bluff AVA. Uh, and those were planted in the early 80s as well. And then a block going back to the early 1970s at Dionysus that um, a lot of great wineries have worked with that. I kind of came up in the Columbia Winery uh, universe and David Lake made a really magnificent you know, Cabernet Sauvignon out of that block. So this is just a, you know, little par few little parcels that we work with in the Older Vine, Old Vine program. We've got, we make another kind of larger wine that's Old Vine Cab, but we did this one as a small, you know, a little more specific blend, so. Yeah, I mean, let's really geek up, geek out on these sites. So, um, sure. and, you know, you're talking about these three sites, uh, a lot of older sites. What do you feel like each site brings to the wine in terms of like uh, what you experience on the palate? Um, both Boucher and Gamache. So Boucher is in the Yakima Valley and it's fairly high elevations over, a, over a thousand feet there. Um, and that tends to be a later ripening site and it tends to have quite a bit of, um, real savory fruit character to it. 2018 was a dynamite vintage. So, I mean, really everything got nice and nice and ripe that year. And I find that there's still some of the same kind of more delicate aromatics, um, and a little more savory kind of character on the palate from Boucher and from Gamache. And the Dionysus block, it's kind of sits there right up above the Columbia River and looks out across at the Hanford Reach and everything. Beautiful site. And that Cabernet every single year is very earthy, really punchy. Um, I, I mean, all three of these, you know, they're very, very special sites, but they kind of, they, they work well together. And Old Vine Cab, I mean, is can be kind of a challenge in certain vintages because most old vines in Washington state have some degree of problem with leaf roll virus, um, which can keep the yields down, can slow down ripening, things like that, which in a, oftentimes can be really beneficial, but in other years it can, you know, you're kind of looking at your watch and looking at the calendar and, you know, so 
quite traditionally, these blocks will come in kind of mid-October, which can, you know, can be a little dicey, but 20, yeah. I mean, again, like I said, 18 is... 2019, I guess, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it depends on the site, depends on the vintage, but, um, yeah. but I mean, and that's one of those challenges for farmers as well, you know, I mean, you got to, every year is different and you have to kind of work with the different challenges and where your vineyards are at, you know? Yeah. You guys have a really uh, strong following for a wine that I always enjoy out of your portfolio. Um, talking about the Sparkman Evermore Cabernet Sauvignon wine that mm. um, I really feel like has uh, has been so consistent over the years. Uh, wine that you know, for my palate, I've, I've enjoyed very much. Um, my, you know, my question to you is, how do you feel like this wine would be like a little different than that wine in terms of like, uh, you know, if you had them both side by side in the glass? Yeah, I mean, I think what we frequently the the Evermore has a little bit more just is about, well, I don't know, five vintages out of seven or whatever we're at right now. It's been entirely, um, entirely from Dionysus. So a little more earthy, a little bit more, um, um, I don't know, more chocolate, less, a little bit less of a fruit driven wine. And I think what, um, with the, all the structure that we had in 2018, bringing some of those elements of a little more savory, some some bay leaf, some more lifted aromatics from those other two sites. I think it helps to to make it a little. Um, I mean, I think it makes it a very pretty wine. So we do two other, you know, kind of our traditional normal annual Cabernet Sauvignons, Rainmaker and Kingpin. And I think Rainmaker really has a lot of that, you know, savory. Uh, you know, it's not the most tannic Cabernet that we make, but there's just so many you know, so much going on in those wines that it's really pretty. Whereas the Kingpin is, you know, punchy Red Mountain kind of, you know, really big structured Cabernet. And I think I, what I like about this blend is that it brought some of that kind of more muscular elements that we have in some of the wines and some of the more graceful aromatic ones um, together just to, you know, to do something different. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a really, really cool wine, um, you know, uh, 2018, what I've tasted so far has been really impressive for red wines across the board. And uh, James and Casey, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on uh, the 2018 vintage, what you, what your experience is. Uh, maybe you kind of feel the same way that Lynn was saying, kind of like out of the darkness. <laughs> you know, you have this, this really killer vintage uh, for my palate, at least. Yeah, I, I, I think it's in Walla Walla Valley. It was great vintage. Um, it's more classically structured. I think the wines are ageable. They've got a great balance between structure, fruit, and acidity. Um, I loved it. It's one of my, one of my favorites. I, th I think 18, I mean, as from a winemaking standpoint, was fairly easy. It was, you know, it, it was generous, but also fresh. There was, there's ripeness. There wasn't any major obstacles that we had to face it was it was a it was a gift basically to us as winemakers yeah D does that does that vin like james does that vintage remind you of another vintage in particular or is it kind of like all on its own some some winemakers have said it kind of reminds them of 12 but it's like different at the same time i was going to say 12 but i i think that there's a 12 may have been a little bit more generous and we're 18, I, there's, there's great structure. The tannin structure is, is there, um, you know, we don't make Bordeaux varieties, but like when I taste the 18s, one of the things that I love about it is there is a bit of herbaceousness with that generous fruit. And it's not like herbal, but it's like, there's a little bit of bay leaf and mint and, and those things that make Cabernet so interesting for me. Yeah. Well, we've got a really cool wine that you've crafted, um, not from um, where your winery sits. It's actually from Red Mountain, from Heart of the Hill. Uh, it was nice talking to you about a, a little more about this wine before our show started. Um, but I'd love to, uh, I'd love to taste through this wine. This is uh, Moved from Red Mountain, uh, 2019. Um, so this is grown by Scott Williams of Kiona, and. We've been working with Scott for, for a long time. Um, and I think one of the things that's really interesting working with Scott is having been born raised on Red Mountain, he has a 
Red Mountain is in his bones and he's watched it go from being this crazy project that his dad and Jim worked on from CL that people thought they were ludicrous to, to plant grapes out there to being now surrounded by grapes. Yeah. And one of the things Scott has talked about is he's worried about that Red Mountains becoming homogenous. And so working with him, it's like you walk through his vineyards and he's returning a lot of native plants back into the vineyards. So you've got blue stem wheatgrass, this native wheatgrass from Washington. You've got sagebrush and rabbit brush growing in there. And they're actually growing in amongst the vines and these aromatic desert steppe kind of plants. Um, that he's letting return back into the vineyard. And, and I think like this aromatic prettiness, it's often why Red Mountain is thought of as this powerhouse, but there's a, there's a prettiness. And when you, when you sit out there and you're cruising the vineyards at harvest and it's, it's sunset because it's the last time you're making that vineyard run and you're hitting that vineyard. And this is the time you're getting there and you're racing the sun and you're sitting in that vineyard at sunset. And Red Mountain is so pretty at that time of the day. And you can smell those desert plants and you can smell that. And it's generous too. It's, it's ripe. It's, but Morvedra is like that last ripening of the grape. Um, it parks itself at 21 and a half bricks for five weeks at a time. And we just sit there and watch it and go, is it going to do anything or is it just stuck there? And then kind of at the end, it, 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 it Kind of flips a switch and says okay i'm ready and that's that's when we go for it and so i like more vedger that way from red mountain because it's red mountain being a warm generous region but more vedger can put prettiness back into wine from red mountain it, it can get the citrus aspect this this kind of lighter aspect we we back off barrels this is all aged and fermented in concrete and 35 hectoliter oak uprights and aged no barrels whatsoever so the idea is trying to, to look at that prettiness if I could capture that that desert step that sunset that 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 breeze of of harvest time on Red Mountain that would be the, the ultimate goal and uh, I think Morvedra being one of the grapes that Washington has tremendous potential with um, yeah, I totally agree. I'm, and uh, and thank you so much for that brilliant portrayal of what you experience in the vineyard. If you're standing there, um, and we were talking earlier, you know, I, I'm just kind of curious to get your thoughts on the herbal characters that are imparted in the wine. Do you kind of feel like that, you know, um, sagebrush, rabbit brush, like uh, wheatgrass character somehow, you know, um, gets you know, kind of trans somewhat transformed into the bottle when you're tasting the wine or smelling the wine? Um, I can't give you any empirical evidence that says <laughs> that's the case. I mean, the, the, everyone wants to go back to the eucalyptus and Cabernet. Um, but, you know, when you walk in these vineyards and you brush against these, these desert step plants, they're incredibly aromatic. And whether or not it's the plants themselves that are contributing the aromatics or, or actually just bringing back that, that desert step health and things, if they, the, whether or not one thing contributes to the end isn't important, it's the end result that's important. And that's that elusive sense of like, I want it to smell and taste like Red Mountain. Um, just like I want wines from the gorge to smell and taste of the gorge, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, for people at home that are not familiar with, um, you know, Moved or Round varietals from the uh, from the Gorge ABA, and they might be more familiar with, uh, you know, Red Mountain uh, Round varietals. Can you, um, you know, obviously we're not tasting your um, Gorge Round varietals, but I'm I'm curious, going to get your thoughts on how, uh, you know, maybe there are some similar veins and differences that you could kind of um, talk about. Uh, the gorge is crazy. Um, I mean, I go from in in ten minutes, I can go from a place that barely ripens grapes for sparkling wine to being able to. Well, we we barely ripen Syrah, um, but that being the case, it's 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 a crazy place to grow grapes in the gorge. It's uh, dynamic. It's very elemental. It's raw elemental energy. We've got wind and sun and rain it's the, the grapes grown here 
tend to be thick skinned and very intense, but also low pH, high acid. Um, and so the gorge is really different. Um, Red Mountain is much warmer. The wines come across with a sense of warmth and comfort and, and ageability. The gorge, the wines are a little tougher in their youth and take more time to settle in. Um, I mean, there's a lot of com conversations here in the gorge where we even are, have started talking about the idea that the red wines are the wines that you drink while you wait for your white wines to mature. <laughs> kind of wild. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but this kind is the, the, or something. The, this is the lone uh, 19. We have two, you know, 18s in our group today. And I'd love to get your thoughts on 19 as a vintage. Um, obviously for, for some, some challenges, but a lot of uh, bright spots too, I think probably. 19 was, was crazy vintage um, in that it, it finished long and slow. Um, and for some varieties like Morvedra, that was great because it, it, like I said, it parks itself at 21 and a half bricks and sits there for weeks on end. And over the years, I've just learned to like let that go. And so it, it holds on to acid. There's a lot of freshness. Um, and 19 was just like it, it, early on was hot and intense and then finished long and cool and slow. It, it, it was for, for us growing more Vedra and Syrah and things like that. It was a spectacular vintage because the wines have this really elevated acid level that comes through on the end. And uh, they're maybe not as black as, as some other vintages, but that's okay. I think there's a lot of prettiness and finesse that comes from a vintage like 19. Yeah, I mean, Casey, um, you know, you're growing grapes in a different area, the Wall Wall Avia. I'd love to get your thoughts on 19 um, in Wall Wall. I just, I loved everything. Whites, rosés, uh, most Bordeaux red niche varietals, um, properly crop. A um, little bit of a challenge in 19 with Cabernet and maybe cooler sites or a little heavier crop load. Uh, but uh, what's interesting I found in cooler vintages is particularly the Cabernets that take more time to evolve in cellar. And we've just done some 2019 tastings this week. And I was kind of stunned at how they'd evolved and knit together and actually gotten denser in barrel. And I, I sometimes see that happen that, you know, the wine actually from nowhere comes up with more body and depth. And 19 is certainly like that. And I like the acid balance a lot. And, uh, you know, we made some great wines during cooler vintages like 19. So there are some big successes that year. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, we have uh, our final wine that you've, uh, you've crafted. It is a Merlot that's called the Foothills Reserve um, from 18. So we're going back to 18. Um, you were saying earlier, you just like enamored by this vintage. Yeah, the, uh, the 18 vintage gave us the right weather to make great Merlot. Um, we're blessed with, I think, one of the better climates in the world uh, for Merlot. Merlot doesn't like to be overstressed. It likes to be stressed just enough. So soil depth and uh, water levels and wind, uh, it responds um, dramatically if these, if these stressing elements um, are uh, too much for it. And so I like, uh, we tend to, we have this beautiful band of soil in the valley that, uh, runs between about 900 and 1500 feet and it stretches from the north down to the southern hills across this selection of vineyards that we've used in this blend and uh, it just seems to be a sweet spot for Merlot. You get that balance, you get structure, you get fruit um, and it's, uh, it's a place that makes it pretty easy to grow great Merlot. So uh, it seems to like it in the valley. It likes it in Washington state. You know, we're dry, we're sunny, you know, we get plenty of heat. So it's, uh, I usually tell people from other areas that, you know, we're cheating out here, the weather's so good. Uh, but then we have the winter, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, this, this wine is a special project um, that we've been working on for several years where we love Merlot. Um, you know, no one should uh, forget that Merlot is one of the great red wines of the world, that the foundation of Bordeaux's success is actually Merlot. 
and that uh, some of the most expensive wines in the world are Merlot based. So um, it's, uh, we've championed this uh, varietal through, you know, thick and thin through, and uh, this is, I think uh, we're getting up into the low thirties of the number of vintages I've made Merlot from Walla Walla, but we wow. uh, decided we wanted to make the ultimate Merlot out of Walla Walla. And uh, what that meant was uh, special selections in the vineyard, um, special barrel aging, and uh, a dedication to making something with balance, but density and uh, uh, the capability to age. And we're often accused of making Merlot like it was Cabernet, but I don't care. I think it's uh, Merlot that can age well is a pretty exciting product and it uh, rewards you in the end. Um, good Merlot should be seductive and hedonistic. Uh, I don't, this, this is a little bit of a challenging wine, but it's, uh, it's got that core of pleasure, pleasurable characters that are the attraction of Merlot. That's really why you, you, know, you want to grow Merlot. Um, and I, I kind of think uh, you don't necessarily need to drink your Merlot while you're waiting for Cabernet from Seven Hills. It, sometimes it goes both ways. But uh, um, I could talk a little bit about where this comes from specifically. Uh, there's a small amount of our old blocks, uh, Seven Hills Winery Estate vineyard in here. Um, and that tends to lend um, a little bit of herb and uh, tobacco leaf and brown leaf character with fruit and acidity. Um, and that's, of course, the state I helped plant back in the early 80s, so emotionally connected to it. Uh, but we went to two other sites also that are up higher up in the valley, um, uh, at the mouth of Mill Creek, uh, a lower site, uh, probably around 1,200 feet or so at um, the uh, Mill Creek Vineyard next to a Beha winery, uh, Clone 15 Merlot. And that has great balance, good density, uh, and some freshness to it. Uh, we get, there's a down mountain wind there that every summer night it comes whistling down out of the Blue Mountains and it's like a giant air conditioner on the vineyard and uh, keeps uh, acid retained and so you get uh, a beautiful balance from that site. And then uh, you go uphill to a place called Kenny Hill, it's named after Ken Hart, uh, one of the local growers here, and that's Clone 9, very rare planting, but we love that site, it has this incredible density of fruit. Um, it's low cropped um, and uh, there's a beautiful view from the vineyard also, which is a plus, you know, it's nice to go there. And yeah. uh, that's about a third of the blend. And then we have some very high end French oak uh, called Richelieu that uh, we put on this wine for uh, mm, about 33 months and then 70% uh, new, which is a pretty high new percentage for us. Yeah, to me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm picking up on a lot of non-fruit character right now, the tobacco leaf, menthol, um, sagebrush, and a, a ton of like cocoa powder or, or milk chocolate tones. Um, for me, that's really, uh, really nice. Gives us kind of a um, kind of an added feeling of decadence. Uh, and the mid palate is really great too. The, the, when, you're, when you taste a wine, I feel like it's got a really nice uh, richness on the mid palate, but also very refined tannins. It just kind of like, uh, kind of holds everything in place. Yeah, I, I like non-fruit characteristics in a wine. I'm not afraid of a little herb. I think it makes it more interesting with food. Um, I'm not afraid of harvesting a little bit earlier than most. Uh, I think it makes a wine that evolves in a more dramatic way in bottle and, uh, you know, it just uh, more enchanting my my take on it and uh yeah it's a fun wine to make you know it's uh you know just for the private barrel auction and uh you know get something something really special yeah yeah it's a beautiful wine um i'm gonna you know this is our last uh our last winemaker series today i'm just gonna ask a question to you all about merlot uh, you know if you're on a desert island uh what is the one merlot that you would uh drink in the world. I'm going to start with Casey. Boy, you know, um, I've, uh, I've had some great Merlots from Northern Italy and, uh, of course, Washington state as a whole, Walla Walla Valley, um, certain parts of, uh, Sonoma Napa counties, of course, Bordeaux. Um, it's a tough call. 
um, you know, if I was on a desert island though, because I've spent my whole life with my own wine, I wouldn't take it because, you know, right. you know I already had enough of that. But uh, I really liked, uh, you know, St. Emilion's use of Merlot and Cab Franc, um, you know, um, New Chateau Sertan or like Lise Clenet or Prolong Mondeau. Um, and then uh, Reda Gaffey um, out of, uh, Tuscany is beautiful, Bulgaria, some, some, there's, there's some Northern Italy stuff too that's kind of interesting. But there's just so much to choose from. I mean. That's a hard question, right? All right, James, I want to hear your, hear your thoughts on that one. Um, so Desert Island, are we talking tropical? Because then I want to drink champagne. I, mean, I know, dude. Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's like <laughs> a, it's an island where you can only bring one Merlot. You can't bring champagne. I'm and, sorry. Uh, and, uh, oh, so if we're looking like Northern Atlantic islands and so um, I'm going to just fall back on a regional aspect. I think that Washington is hammering it with Merlot. Um, I think Bordeaux has got it dialed, but Washington Merlot is, is, is one of those crazy places that, that does it so interesting. It's, Unfortunately, we, we're still crawling out of the sideways effect, but I think that the Washington Merlots are just freaking dynamite. Um, they bring in this, this density that rivals Cabernet, but they have this herbal fruit aspect. Um, so I'm not going to narrow it down to one producer, but I would say I would choose Washington over Bordeaux even. And I do love oh. Northern Italy too. <laughs> wow okay yeah. did not expect that very cool lynn you're up next what do you think man and you're muted there you go yep just so you can't hear the corgis in the background the queen's in town this weekend so we, uh, they're probably really um, cute though <laughs> yes this is true um i completely agree with james on this and i think merlot has always been given this you know reputation as being the sort of softer roly-poly fruit forward sort of sort of um and i think it's true maybe if you have a napa cabernet next to a napa merlot the merlot is obviously the softer of the two varieties or in bordeaux and you taste through each of the different varieties merlot is obviously rounder and softer than than the hard edge cab but we've got merlot with with grip i mean it doesn't tend to have like the you know, some of the greenness or the edges that Cabernet can have, which there is a cool dynamism in Cabernet that it's kind of a wrestling match between those those characteristics. And I, I, I you know, but with Merlot, the, they're every bit, of, every, eh, I think every bit as age worthy as Cabernet. Um, generally speaking, in our cellar, we work with, you know, Merlot from from all, I mean, you know, a couple of sites in the Yakima Valley. We've worked with it from Red Mountain. We get some out of Winebow and uh, up in the Waluk Slope. So a lot of a lot of different um, variety there, and and they are all, you know, they're. I guess in some ways it's that Merlot gets this reputation of not being quite as serious, and it, like Casey said, it's like there's lots of non-fruit stuff going on in there. They're interesting, you know, they they can be really interesting wines, which is sort of a reputation that it doesn't carry all over the place um i mean everybody loves you know fancy expensive wines from bordeaux angelou's what i think is at least there's a lot of cap franc in that wine too um and i recently actually i opened a wine from sonoma that i bought when my wife and i traveled to sonoma with a friend of ours uh, a raffinelli merlot i bought it when i was there and it was when we opened it recently and thought oh man is it going to be over the hill and it was it was perfect so i mean I wish I had two of them. So that's probably my most recent memory of Merlot, I suppose. But, um, but I mean, I agree. With You're going Washington, okay? Why not? All right, all right. I am. I'm not. I am def I'm. I'm not going to go Washington. I love California Merlot when it's done right. Like uh, you know, our Hourglass Darius. I think they have their own space in the you know in the top top Merlot, but I think um, kind of stealing your uh, Angelus comment, Lynn, I have to say Angelus 
Cheval Blanc. Obviously, there's uh, Cab Franc in there. I guess it's not 100%, but uh, La Dome. I just picked up a uh, 2004 La, La Dome uh, that I haven't opened yet. I'm excited to kind of, not, not a great vintage in Bordeaux, but it uh, doesn't always matter, you know? So, um, so I'm, I'm really kind of excited to see that. You know, uh, 2020 has been a challenge for a lot of us. And, um, you know, it, it, for a lot of the wineries, it, there's certain challenges and struggles uh, dealing with fires, everything, um, having the pandemic, obviously. Um, but I'd love, to, uh, I'd love to hear from you guys kind of in closing some of the uh, positive stuff that has um, happened in 2020, maybe some highlights or things that kind of uh, you look forward to. Hey, I, I, I really want to talk about community on this um, and not only the industry community, but um, in, in Walla Walla, uh, we're a little isolated out here, but um, it, the community really pulled together to make this as, you know, as successful of a year as it could be for the wine industry. Uh, and the, the adaptation that, you know, everybody's done it, but, you know, I see the wine industry mainly, but the adaptation to conditions and, um, you know, it was a wonderful thing to see this, this everybody pulling together and, and working through this. Um, I think it was one of the, the best things that the pandemic brought us, um, you know, it's incredible. Yeah, James, what are your thoughts on some, uh, some kind of positive or positives or highlights out of 2020? Um, so no, nobody's gonna, argue that 2020 wasn't challenging uh, <laughs> yeah but at the same sense I think those of us who've made wine and worked through the vintage there was like a there was a special sense of energy we were faced with we knew we were coming into it with a with with an obstacle and that was the pandemic and then we got thrown some crazy weather and some fires but honestly like looking at it there were people talking like, why even bother make wine on a year like this? And it's like, it, it's even more important to make wine on a year like this. That's so challenging. If they could make wine when they had trenches running through the vineyards of Champagne and everything, it's important to come back, to never forget this vintage because actually the wines from this vintage are quite spectacular. Um, people want to focus on the smoke and the fires and the, the, the rough things. But those of us who made wines here, there's some absolutely spectacular wines that were made in 2020. And there, yeah, there are some bombs in there with some smoke and some other problems, but there's also really amazing wines. And there was a lot of heart and soul poured into the winemaking this year. And I think the wines are gonna really show that. There's a lot of compassion, a lot of energy from both the growers and the producers that are gonna be in these wines. I think the 2020 wines, I'm talking more and more with people, they're really excited about their best wines. Um, yeah. Yeah, Lynn, what are your thoughts on um, some positives? <laughs> For the vintage character, without question, um, the 2020 wines are delicious. And they have this sort of, um, like you know, James had mentioned, uh, and Casey had mentioned about 2018, where there's this sort of, uh, there, there's a kind of a much more feeling of completeness in the in the wines as young wines in barrel, um, and they're you know and they're they're lovely. They'll be fun to you know keep working on. 2020 in general. I mean, we have all had to shift the way that we we sell wine. The auction has had to work <laughs> around that. I mean, we had in the you know research advisory unit committee, we had to find different ways to to fund things and use reserves, and which is why you have them. I mean, it's you know you have to kind of pack a lunch because of years like like 2020 but you know we also reached out more regularly to our regular customers and you know the guests that we normally have coming to the tasting room and couldn't host you know we were doing to-go flights there and there was a lot of opportunity where we needed feedback immediately to see what was you know what was working and and the the folks that you know support us year in and year out anyway I'm sure we all have these folks um it was great to get them to, to, you know, they would pick up the, you know, phone and call us or they would order a to-go wine flight or they would, you know, pick up on one of the, you know, emails that we sent out. And people, I think, wanted the outreach from us and we needed to hear from them. And so it was, it was pretty, 
it was pretty cool in that way. Like, you know, and, and, you know, we probably all ran harvest with slightly smaller crews and, you know, and, and you know, basically we're all in the same pod, regardless of whether we, you know, organized it that way, but it was, you know, it's, it, you know, being on this part of this side of it is, it's, it's been great, you know, and for the, from the vineyard perspective too, you know, we work, you know, initially production facilities could be open because we were an extension of agriculture and, you know, it sort of uh, reminds you of that link that, you know, these farms are growing things that it's like yogurt, <laughs> you know, or something. I stole that line from Nicholas Kiel, but, you know, it's like these things, you don't, you can't just flash freeze Cabernet and make it when things are better you've got to handle it all at the same time. And we all had to kind of, you know, work, work through that together and, you know, see people in masks out in vineyards, you see them, you know, it's, it's, it was weird for sure, but it's yeah. just, you know, special thing to be involved in. Yeah. Guys, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts. Um, yeah. This has been such a great uh, zoom today. It's such a pleasure to be sharing um, all these beautiful wines together and uh, kind of ending on a positive note about 2020, some really good positive developments despite the challenges. I want to let you guys uh, know that the Private Barrel Auction is presented by Winebow Fine Wine and Spirits and the Winemaker Series, the Virtual Winemaker Series is sponsored by Northwest Farm Credit Services and also the Washington State uh, Wine Commission. And, uh, and, and for, uh, this, is, this is my last Zoom I'll be doing for, for this. It's been such a pleasure uh, to be a part of this. Great honor uh, to be involved in um, in, in such a wonderful cause contributing to the uh, Washington State University Viticulture and Enology Program. And with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, Jamie Piha. She is the Executive Director of uh, the Auction of Washington Whites. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in for our last of 10 fantastic educational sessions with Owen Bargreen. Owen, thank you so much for hosting this. I know I've learned a lot sitting and listening to winemakers chat about their wines and what's happening in their areas is just fascinating. And I know that everybody tuning in also had a great time. So I wanna just thank the three of you for your time and effort and all that you do to support the wine industry and the auction of Washington wines. Um, we're very excited about the upcoming private barrel auction. Uh, the virtual close will be April 20th and the wines are beautiful. The list of wines is fantastic. Some wonderful, interesting varietals. And I think people are really going to uh, be excited to bid on those and it's pretty exciting also that it raises money for our industry. The industry is really giving back to itself through this auction. Uh, we have many other events that the auction does do so for those of you listening in I hope you'll check out our website at auctionofwawines.org to see what other events are coming up and I just want to thank everybody so much uh, for participating and wishing you all well and uh, we'll see you We'll see you soon, hopefully in person somewhere. I have one thing to add. The great thing that came out of this whole COVID thing is the fact that I, I ditto what you were saying, Lynn. It, it caused all of us to really reach out uh, in ways we hadn't done before. And I know for the auction of Washington Wines, what it did was really create a whole new audience for us. People that maybe had never attended our events in the past were thrilled to be able to find wines online through us. And we really created a whole new channel. And, and I, I think some of the things we learned during this time are things that will stick with all of us as we continue to do business moving forward and hopefully just benefit the Washington wine industry and all of the people who, who love our wines. And we're just gonna keep growing that base together. So thank you everybody for participating and uh, we'll see you out there. Hope to see you soon. Cheers. Thanks, Jamie. Cheers, everybody.